Welcome, church. We are so happy that you are here. My name is Judah, and I'm lead pastor here at Thrive Church. And, you know, uh, our, our country has been going through a lot of crazy things in the last couple of weeks. Last week, uh, we, we uh, took a collection uh, for those who suffered in Helene. And, and this week, now, uh, another hurricane, Milton, is, is hitting Florida. And so we want to encourage you that if you would like to, to get involved and, and donate towards that, we're going to be partnering with Samaritan's Purse. We may even uh, be doing some other things along with that. But if you want to uh, be able to impact some people uh, in a different location, we would encourage you to do that. You can donate to Thrive. Just uh, mark off. Uh, you can, if you do it online, you can check off uh, uh, missions or you can uh, notate that on your uh, envelope. Just say relief and we will make sure that those funds get where they are needed. And just be praying for all of those who are in these situations. You know, we're in a series right now called One Liners, and we started this last week, and throughout this we're talking about, you know, the, these one-line sentences or statements, things that, that guide our lives, things that, that help us to be a church that, that God wants us to be, but not just in church, but also outside of church as well. But since it's called One Liners, you know, I gotta take the opportunity, did it last week, do it this week, this week we're, I'm gonna hit you up with some light bulb jokes, okay, so here we go. How many narcissists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one. They hold on to it, and the world spins around them. Um, how many politicians does it cha- take to change a light bulb? We will never know, because they're still arguing about it. Uh, how many pastors does it take to change a light bulb? One to change it, and three committees to approve it, and another one to decide who's bringing the potato salad. Um, how many chiropractors does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but it's going to take seven visits to do it. Uh, How many doctors does it take to change a light bulb? Three. First, you have to have a bulb specialist. Then you have to have a bulb installation specialist. And then you got to have someone to bill insurance, of course. Um, How many stockbrokers does it take to change a light bulb? One to take it out, take out the old one, then drop it, and another one to sell it before it crashes. Uh, How many bodybuilders does it take to change a light bulb? Well, one to change it, and one to spot them, and another one to video the whole thing to post it online. How many mystery writers does it take to change a light bulb? One to write it, and then another one to give an interesting twist at the end. Um, And finally, how many country singers does it take to change a light bulb? Take six, one of them to change the light bulb, and five of them to sing about how much they like the old one. Um, Anyhow, enough of that. Uh, These are things, though, these one-liners are things that we want to be known for as a church. Last week we talked about about praying for each other and how so often we throw this statement around saying, I'll be praying for you, right? You say, I'll be praying for you. And then do we actually go pray for them? Do we actually, or are we just saying the words in the moment where instead we could actually just pray for the person? And so that's my challenge to everybody here is is to take those opportunities. If somebody's telling you about a difficulty that they're facing, a sickness that they're going through, a struggle, don't say, I'll be praying for you. Say, can I pray for you now? Or better yet, let me pray for you. Don't even ask for permission. Just say, let me pray for you right now. The quote that we're talking about today, the one-liner today, though, it's in your notes, is every person who comes to church is a prodigal coming home. Every person who comes to church, every person who comes through these doors is a prodigal son or prodigal daughter coming home. Now, now this word prodigal is not a word that we use a lot, like out in the real world. Like if you grew up in church, you probably heard this word a lot, but out in the real world, we don't use this word a lot. So the definition of prodigal, interestingly enough, is someone who likes to spend money recklessly or extravagantly. I won't ask you to raise your hands if you're a prodigal like that. Now, this does apply to the prodigal in the story that we'll read. But the way we've come to to use this word often is is someone who returns home after a long absence. Someone who returns home. They're a prodigal. They were out wandering, and now they've come back home. Well, we as a church, we believe that everyone who walks through these doors is like a prodigal returning home. Someone returning home, no matter how far they've wandered, no matter where they've gone, the the goal is that we welcome them with open arms, just as the Father does in the story. Now, maybe you've heard this story before. It's, It's the most popular parable that Jesus told. 
But, but the story is, is one of, uh, of, of, of acceptance and of love. The church must be a place of love and acceptance and celebration, not of judgment and rejection. And honestly, we're all prodigals in some way and at some time in our life. So we're going to take a look at this story. It's only recorded in one of the Gospels, and it's in the Gospel of Luke. Luke was, was not a direct uh, disciple of Jesus, but he was a follower after the resurrection. He was not a Jew. He was, uh, 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 he was a doctor. And here in Luke 15, 1, is where this whole thing begins. This is tax collectors and other notorious sinners, okay? So I got the, ta- got the IRS and other sinners, right? This is tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people and even eating with them. I mean, that this was not a good look for Jesus. They're like, how could you, Jesus, how could you associate with these people? And you call yourself a rabbi. And you call yourself a man of God. People are saying that you're the Messiah. And look at the company that you're keeping. Look at the people that you're hanging around with. You're guilty by association. Because you hang out with them, you must be like them as well. Now, I know people who have spent their whole lives trying to keep away from people like this, trying to keep away from, from, from sinners. In fact, I, I was like that for, for, for many years. It was, I looked at the people that I associated with, my friends, and, and they were all people who were following God and, and all that. That seems good. It's like, like, how can I influence the world? That's why I took up arm wrestling was because I wanted to, to get out and just meet real people. People that, 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 that their lives didn't revolve around church and the Bible and things of God and such things as that. You know, if Jesus was here today, who would he be hanging out with? He'd be hanging out with the broken, the rejects, the tax collectors and notorious sinners, as it says here. So, so Jesus is doing that. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're coming at Jesus. They're criticizing him. So he decides to tell them three stories. Okay, gather around. It's story time with Jesus. And he tells them three stories. The first story that he tells them is called the parable of the lost sheep. And he says, well, there's a, a shepherd and he's got a hundred sheep. And one of the sheep sneaks away. What does the shepherd do? Well, the shepherd would leave the 99 and he would go and find the sheep and bring it back so it could be safe. And everybody's kind of agreeing with this. Then he tells another story about a woman who had 10 valuable coins, but she loses one of them. And then she tears up the entire house looking for this coin. She's looking for it. She's looking everywhere. And then finally finds the lost coin. She's searching every corner. Have you ever lost something before? Ever lost something and tried to find it? Okay, half of you. Some of you, you're like, I don't know. I don't don't even know how I got here. You know, it's like, I'm I'm losing my marbles, you know. I I lost my phone about a week ago. And I'm looking all over for it. I'm shining my light. I'm Because it's dark. I'm trying to... And then I realize my light is attached to my phone. And if only I look, you know, I'm like, what in the world am I doing here? Um, We lose things. In fact, you guys lose things here all the time. Sometimes it's things that are valuable. Sometimes it's a phone or a purse or, or, or a special water bottle or car keys. We've had wallets, all kinds of things. People will call and say, hey, do we leave that here? We'll look around. Yeah, we found it. Come pick it up, whatever. And then there's a bunch of junk back there. We got lost and founds at every campus, which just piles up stuff. And, and after a while, we just get rid of it. So if you're losing something, if you lost something, you're wondering where it is, make sure you stop by the lost and found and check and see, because we would love to give it to you. Hey, Take some extra stuff. We don't care. We don't want it here. Here's the thing, though. Jesus is telling these stories about these lost and found, a lost and found sheep, a lost and found coin. The point, though, is he's talking about people, right? He's talking about people and that in your notes, each person truly matters to Jesus. Each person truly matters. Did you know you matter to Jesus? You matter to Jesus. I matter to Jesus. And God is always searching for us. Continuing on in Luke 15, 11, after he tells these two stories, he says, to illustrate the point further, because two stories clearly wasn't enough, he's going to tell another story. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons. A man had two sons. 
And, and I also find it interesting how, how the percentages of the lost thing keeps getting like greater and greater. Right there, you got 99, one is lost. That's 1% lost. Then you got the lady with 10 coins. She loses one. That's 10% lost. Now you got two, two, two boys and, and one is, is lost, and that's 50% lost, right? And, and so he tells the story about two sons, and the younger son says to his dad, I want my inheritance now. Now, typically speaking in that culture as well as ours, you get your inheritance when your parents die. And so uh, the dad didn't die yet. He's like, dad, you're not dying quick enough, but I would like my money now. And so he takes the money and he goes off to a distant city. And the Bible says that he, he used it in wild parties. So you can imagine what was going on there. I mean, he's just living it up, living it up with, 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 with drink and prostitutes and parties and all kinds of things. He's just living his life. And, and so he's out there, but eventually, because he's not investing, he's not doing anything productive with the money, the money runs out. Around the same time, a famine hits the land. And so not only does his money run out, but now he finds himself starving. He's got nothing to eat. He's trying to figure out some way to, to just get some food in his belly. And so, so he goes and he offers his services to a pig farmer. He begins uh, you know, giving, uh, feeding the pigs, giving them their slop, this is a degrading job for somebody like him. I mean, his dad was, was reasonably well off, and now he's just feeding the pigs. This is a disgrace for any Jewish boy as well, because, I mean, pigs aren't kosher. We know that. And here he is, he, and he's out there just feeding the pigs. He's so hungry, he wants to start eating the pig slop. That's how hungry he is. And he's just disgusted with, with where he is, and he's starving. And in Luke 15, verse 17, this is when he finally came to his senses. You ever in a situation like that where you just finally come to your senses? Like, finally you get some clarity in life. He finally comes to his senses. He said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I know what I'll do. He says, I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So please take me on as a hired servant? Would you at least give me a job? Maybe I can even pay back some of the debt, but would you at least give me a job so I can have some, some food to eat? And, and I think this is kind of interesting because as I've been reading this and studying it, I kind of realized that, that his whole motivation for wanting to go home was simply hunger because he's hungry. Some of you, you're getting hungry right now. You're like, yeah, I, I, I can understand that. And he's just hungry, and he wants to go. He's not really sorry, per se. We don't see like, like that he's sorry, but, he, but he's hungry. He probably would have stayed longer if the money hadn't run out. But the money ran out, and now he just wants a good, hot meal. And for many of us, hunger is what drives us back to the Father. I've got a hunger in my life that I've just not been able to satisfy. I tried all of these things. I, I, I did it all. I, I, I experienced everything that life has to offer, and yet I still feel hungry. And we're hungry for something, and, and then we find ourselves coming to the Father. Maybe that's what brought you to church when you first began. Maybe there was a hunger in your life that you just couldn't fill, a need in your life that was just going unmet. Maybe there was an emptiness that you were experiencing. Maybe there was loneliness. Maybe there, there was heartache and depression and worry. And you said, I just, I just need something. I need something. And then you were invited to church. Maybe a friend, maybe a neighbor, maybe a family member. Say, hey, why don't you come with me? Maybe you get a postcard. Maybe you just go online and say, church is in my area. I'm just going to show up at one. I, you know what? I'm going to do this. There's this hunger. Maybe if I go to church, something will work out to me. And then the day comes. You've decided now the day comes, and, and, and you're kind of tired. You, you, maybe you, you lose your keys. You're trying to find your keys. It's like, like, I don't know. It seems like every obstacle is, is in your, your, your way. I've heard people say, oh, we're getting ready to come to church and realize that th their gas tank was on empty. And they're like, well, you know, I can't go now. Like all these things come. Maybe you got in a fight at work. Maybe you got in a fight at home. Maybe you just got a, a bad grade. Maybe it's raining out. Like I can't go to church in the rain. Maybe it's sunny out. Like, oh, I can't waste a good day like this. 
Maybe it's too cold out. Maybe it's too hot. Like we get all these excuses. No, I'm just going to go some other. What do I even wear anyway? What if I go wearing the wrong thing? What if, I, if I'm too dressed up? Maybe I'm not dressed up enough. Like what happens? Like what, what do I do? And they, they got all of these things, all of these obstacles trying to get them to stop, trying to get them not to go. In your notes, never underestimate what a person went through to get to church. Never underestimate what, it, what a person goes through when, when, they, when they arrive here. Like, we don't know. We don't know the fights in the car. We don't know what was going on, you know, in their day and in their life throughout the week. Each of us have a story. And God is, is working in the hearts of every single person that walks through the doors. He's inviting people. He's drawing people by the Holy Spirit. But there's these obstacles, and we can't underestimate that. And so we have this son, and he's out there, and he's, He's literally hit rock bottom. He's feeding the pigs. You know, I'm just going to go back. Maybe dad will hire me. And in verse 20, it says, So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And filled with, with love and compassion. He wasn't filled with, with bitterness and rage, but, but filled with love and compassion. He runs to his son. He embraces him. He kisses him. His son said to him, the pre-rehearsed speech that he'd already planned, right? He'd been planning. He says, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead. And has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. The dad, he sees him a long way off. You know what this implies to me? This implies that dad was waiting. Right? Dad was, dad was scanning. Dad was looking. Every time he walks out, he's like, one of these days, I bet I'm going to see him come around that corner. One of these days, I'm going to spot my son coming home. One of these days, maybe he'll be there. And, he, and dad is looking, and dad is, is hoping he was ready for his son to come home. And when the son came home, the dad didn't bring up the past. He just kind of, kind of ignored it. He didn't say, okay, well, well, what's your plan for paying me back for this inheritance I gave you? With interest, of course. Like, uh, that, that wasn't what he was talking about. He, he, and, and the son, when he comes back, he doesn't even really give an apology, does he? Like, all he said was, was I've sinned against both heaven and you. I can't be your son, but, but maybe I'll be a servant. It wasn't even a real apology, he didn't say, Dad, I'm sorry that I did this to you. I'm sorry for hurting you. The, but the father is happy to have his son back. And the dad's reaction isn't in anger. The reaction isn't in frustration or even disappointment. His reaction is with compassion and love. He runs out to meet his son. He runs out with open arms. He's eager to restore I mean, the son even says, he says, oh, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even worthy to be your son. I just want to be, I just want to be maybe a hired servant. I want to be a hired servant. And, and, and the dad just kind of, kind of ignores this whole thing. What's amazing, though, for us is that God accepts us and he restores us and he's waiting for us as well and you know it's God is always ready to welcome us home with arms open eager to restore us not not just to accept us but but to restore us to bring that that restoration you see what happens the son says well I'm not even worthy to be your son I just want to be a servant the dad doesn't even acknowledge that he said anything right what does he say he says bring me some clothes Bring, bring him some, a fresh set of clothes. He smells like a pig. Like, br bring me some shoes. Bring me the family ring so he can put the ring on so everybody knows that he's my son. He accepts him and he restores him to his rightful place. And that's what God wants to do to us. And the amazing thing about you and me is this, is that we're not even blood heirs of Christ. We're adopted into God's family. We have no rightful claim to anything. And yet it's given freely to us. We're adopted children. We're, we've been chosen by God. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. It says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. 
by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. See, God adopted you. God ado- it's one thing to, to, to have you know, a, a child naturally that's born to you, but it's another to go out and pick somebody and say, I want you in my family. And that's what God has done. God chose you to be in his family. And in your notes, the Father runs towards us even when we feel like we're unworthy. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Maybe I could be a servant, but that's about it. I'm not worthy to be forgiven. I'm not worthy to be accepted after all I've done. And yet the Father runs to us even when we feel unworthy. So here's the other side of the coin, though. How do we act when the prodigal comes home? Now, first off, in this story, we're not the father, Right? We're not the father. God is, is the father in the story who's, who's receiving his, his child back home. But how do we act when we see someone come to faith in Christ, come through the doors of church? Because you're either one of two people in this story. You're either the prodigal son. You're either the prodigal daughter, the, 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 the child who is lost and then comes back, or, or you're the other brother, the older brother. See, there was another brother. Remember we said there was two brothers, and this brother was in the field working. And as he's out there, he's working. He's working to to increase the profit for his dad. He's working to, to build the family wealth. He's out there working hard day in and day out to do what his father wants, and he hears a party going on. He's like, what's going on? I hear a party. And one of the other uh, you know, employees there, one of the other workers there says, oh, they're having a party because your brother's back. And you'd think that he would be happy. You'd think that he would be excited that his brother is back, but no. In Luke 15, verse 28, it says, The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never even gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. How dare you? I'm the one who's out here working hard. I'm the one who's, who, who's here. Day. I, I didn't leave you. I didn't abandon you. And here you're celebrating him? Now, it's important for us to realize who the audience of this story was. Who was the audience of the story we talked about in the very first verse that we read? He says that that Jesus was hanging around the tax collectors and other notorious sinners and the Pharisees and the other religious leaders were criticizing him because of the company that he kept. Because he's hanging out with the scum of the earth. He's hanging out with losers and rejects. People probably a lot like you and me, honestly. He was hanging out with these people. Jesus hanging out with them and people are criticizing Jesus for hanging out with the wrong crowd. So guess what Jesus did? Jesus wrote them into the story as the older brother. He writes them into the story. See, when a person, we talked about, you know, they they go through all these obstacles. They go off all these obstacles to get to to come to church, to come, they're like, maybe maybe this will help me, maybe this will help me get through this divorce, maybe this will help me get through my depression, maybe this will help me get through school, maybe this will help give purpose and meaning in my life, and they finally come to the door, and they walk in, and no one says hi. Hi. No one greets them. Everyone's just kind of going about their business, kind of ignoring them, won't make eye contact. And this person's mind, they're like, oh, they must all know each other. Oh, I must be an outsider. Oh, somebody looked at me. Oh, they, they, they must, I must not have worn the right thing. I must look like I'm out of place. You know, this is all pointless. And you know what? If we fail to make them feel welcome, I believe this breaks the heart of God. It's easy for us to say we're a welcoming church, but it's, a, it's another thing entirely to actually become one. See, in your notes, we can't drop the ball when God brings people to our door. Maybe you're here for the first time. And man, I sure hope we, we, we demonstrate this to you today, that, that you feel welcomed in love. This is why, okay, this is why, just gonna give you a little peek under the hood. This is why at the end of every service, we say things like, before you leave, find two or three people you don't know and, and greet them. And, and you know what? You know what we do? A lot of times we just bolt out the door. We just leave. 
Like, you know, I, I just, I got to get somewhere. I, that, that's kind of awkward. And, every, before every service, we gather for prayer. And I challenge our team. I'm like, hey, this is your number one priority to go out to talk to people, to greet people, to love people, to pray for people. Make sure we don't drop the ball. And, and sometimes we drop the ball. We're, we're hanging out other places. We see our friends. I want to talk to my friends. And we're ignoring the people that God has brought, the prodigal sons and daughters that are there for the first time. And we're just ignoring them. Like, I don't mean to step on toes, but I kind of do a little bit. Because God wants us to be welcoming like he's welcoming. See, the Father's heart is ready to receive. Not waiting to scold us. Not waiting to point out our flaws. The Father, what was the Father doing? He was looking for that prodigal. He was scanning. It's got to be... One of these days, he's going to come in these doors. One of these days. And there's people that are praying for loved ones. There's people that are hurting. And today, and Sundays, and Wednesdays, and other days of the week, there's, there's people that, are like, you know what, maybe, just maybe, I'll go. And do we drop the ball? Or are we looking like the Father is scanning the horizon, saying, ah, I'm going to look for someone to talk to. This is the Father ran to meet him. See, this is God's heart for everyone that returns to him, that comes to the gathering of faith. It's not that we look at them in judgment, but that we're, we accept them with open, welcoming arms. See, God is always searching for us. If you're lost, he's seeking you. If we go missing, he finds us. If we're rebelling against us, him, he forgives us and he welcomes us home. See, church needs to be a place where people feel like they're coming home. Home to community, home to, to love, home to faith, home to Jesus. Where they're celebrated and not shamed. See, see we're here to, to restore, to bring restoration, not condemnation. That we love people. That we seek to, to introduce them to Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Messiah, the King, the one who heals, the one who does bring the transformation. Maybe people, they come and they're, they feel nervous and they're fearful for even coming. But they're like, yeah, I, I got to push through it because, because you're tired of being tempted with the slop that the world offers. And God's been waiting for them. And he's been drawing them by the Holy Spirit. Let us not drop the ball. See, the Father seeks to accept and restore. And, and church is the home where we can find restoration. The Father's focus was on the Son's return, not on the mistakes that have been made. And we need to adopt the same mindset. It's easy for us to see somebody and be like, well, you know what, they look different from me. They dress differently. I don't know about this person. And I've heard so many stories of this, people walking into churches and feeling ostracized from the very moment they step in. But we need to be celebrating people's return to God and not dwelling on their past. And as a church, we want to follow God's example in this, looking to the horizon for the sons and the daughters who come back home. This is a partnership between us and God because you're one of these brothers in the story. You're either the one who needs to return home or you're the one who opens up his arms. Let's not be like the older brother. Let's change that story and be like the warm, welcoming brother who says, I am so glad that you're here. I'm going to celebrate with you. I'm going to rejoice with you. I've been praying for you. And we need to be people of faith, people who are willing to put our own awkwardnesses aside, to even say, you know what? I'm not going to hang out with all my friends and family for just a little bit while I'm here, but I'm going to go look out for some people. I'm going to go talk to people. I'm going to pray bold prayers. I'm not just going to tell people I'll be praying for them. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take the step. And this is how we become a welcoming church. This is how we become the body of Christ who welcomes everybody. And it doesn't matter your past. And it doesn't matter what you've done. There's room at the table for you. There's room in God's family for you. Because we were all broken. We were all hurting. We were all prodigals at one time or another. And God is saying, come to me. And he's looking for us. And he's waiting for us. And he receives us back with open arms. Let's pray. God, we come to you and we thank you for receiving us with open arms even when we've wandered, even when we've strayed. We thank you that you didn't just point the finger at us, but you received us and you restored us. 
and you forgave us and you gave us a clean start. If you're here today, maybe this is your first time, maybe you've been coming for a while and you feel like that prodigal saying, yeah, I need that hope, I need that peace. Let me tell you, God's arms are open for you. It says, if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and you say with your mouth that he's your Lord, that you'll be saved. So if that's where you are, all the prodigals call on his name now. Say, Jesus, you are my Lord. And God, for those of us who you have already forgiven and saved and brought transformation, give us the boldness to be more like the Father and not like the older brother. Let us have the heart that you have to welcome people, to love people, to go out of our way, not just in church, but in the world as well, at work and at school and in our neighborhoods. Let us be the person who's willing to cross the line, to go, to talk to someone who no one else talks to, to love the unlovable, to care for the person who feels like everybody's rejecting them, to, to listen to the person who's going through a hard time, to pray for the person who's sick. Lord, let us be your light. Let us be your hands and your feet in this world. Let us make a difference for you. And we thank you for the transformation you've brought to us. So let us do that for others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.